Well, good morning. morning. It's good to be in God's house today, man. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, take them out. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 11 today. Matthew chapter 11. Uh, We're going to be looking at verses 25 through 30 of Matthew chapter 11 today. And uh, we're continuing on in the series, uh, It's the Little Things. And today we're going to be talking about a little rest, a little rest. Um, It seemed like it fit very well because this is Labor Day weekend. Somebody's not happy. (laughs) Oh, no. Okay. I, I, yeah. Uh, Well, she's got a good set of lungs on her. We know that. (laughs) I've had a lot of effects on my preaching, but never quite that reaction, so (laughs) no, it's good to have them with us here today. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about a little rest, and that kind of goes along with Labor Day and Labor Day weekend. You know, Labor Day's a holiday, and I I thought about kind of giving you some history on Labor Day, but I thought, you know, you can look that up on the internet after church if you're interested in that. It began back in the 1800s, and so it's developed into uh, what we look at today as, as Labor Day. Um, Labor Day is the day we rest from all of our labor, right? Supposedly. Uh, My wife used to find it in her um, planning that on Labor Day we work twice as hard at the house as we did if we just went to work. So I think I've got her out of that bad habit by now. Doug Johns told me out in the hallway, is Gene, you're, okay, Gene's in here. I knew Doug wouldn't probably be. He's out roaming the hallways. Doug told me, he said, he said, Don, he said, you know you're getting old when you're excited about Labor Day getting to go to a goat auction. (laughs) And I said, I don't know if that's being old or that's just being from Pike County. He said, I'm excited about this goat auction. You know, I thought, okay, whatever, Doug, that's that's good, okay? So are you are you that excited about it, Gene? Not quite as excited, okay? Well, I don't think he's quite as excited about remodeling that bathroom of yours as you are either, though, so that kind of goes both ways, right? He told me last weekend you spent 17 hours working in that bathroom trying to remodel. Is that true last Saturday? You gutted the whole thing. Okay, well, Labor Day, he gets to go goat shopping tomorrow. He doesn't have to work in the bathroom. Okay. So, you know, we set aside a day, and, and, you know, you guys will spend it all different ways tomorrow. Some of you be going out and cooking out and having family in, and some of you just do nothing. Some of you work twice as hard. I don't know. But we need rest. In, In fact... People, uh, one day is not going to take care of it, is it? If you have tomorrow off, some of you still have to work tomorrow. I'm sure of that. But even if you have tomorrow off, that's not going to take care of what you need rest-wise. Uh, and, and that's, people are still tired. Anybody here today, today tired? Okay, I'm going to keep an eye on you, make sure you don't fall asleep. Uh, any of you here weary, kind of weary and worn? How about just plum worn out? Some of us are here that way today. We're tired and weary and worn out. Well, there's good news because Jesus wants to give us the rest that we're all looking for. Jesus wants to give you the rest that you're looking for. Now, before you jump to conclusions, I want you to listen to the message and see what he has to say and how that ties to our rest. You know, in the Bible, in in Matthew, the scripture we're going to look at today, uh, Jesus is dealing with people who are tired and weary and worn out, just like today. Now, they probably had more reason to be tired, weary, and worn out than we do, we're going to see, but it's the same as it's it's been. Back when they uh, came up with Labor Day, do you know they were laboring 12 hours a day, seven days a week, just to have enough food to put on the table back in the 1800s? The the farming industry had kind of changed into the Industrial Revolution, and more people were working factories and things, and they were working 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and still didn't quite have enough to get by. So labor has always been a part of life, but uh, labor itself is something that Jesus was dealing with, weariness. Um, The Pharisees, Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees. Now some of you know who the Pharisees are, some of you don't. They were a religious group that was supposed to help the people to relieve them from from life, to show them God's way, to show them God's plan, and, and how they could find this rest in the Lord. But instead... The Pharisees decided that they would heap more onto the people than they'd ever experienced. They had more laws and they had more customs and they had more religious rights than they'd ever seen. The Jewish people were trying to uh, 
trying to follow all these laws and customs and religions and things or uh, religious activities and things, but it wore them out. You see, Jesus was dealing with that. In fact, in chapter 12, Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees who were trying to pin him down and trying to destroy him because Jesus was a threat to their way of life. And the Pharisees were, were on to Jesus because he healed a man on the Sabbath day. In other words, on their holy day, Jesus, God's son, could not heal a man. And he was trying to, because the customs and the laws were so strict that you couldn't do that on Sunday or on Saturday as their Sabbath was. And so they, were, they became legalistic. Most of them were hypocrites, too. You ever seen a hypocrite? The hypocrites say one thing, they do another. Now, a lot of times Christians get labeled as hypocrites. I don't believe that. I believe that's an excuse for people not to want to look to God. Now, now I'm sure there's some out there like that, but the majority of Christians try to follow what they believe. But they also, they were hypocrites. They were legalistic, and they were blind to the fact that God's Son was standing right in front of them, doing miracles, trying to show them how to find true rest. And so that's where we pick up the passage today. Jesus is dealing with these Pharisees, these hypocrites, these legalistic people that thought if you can just obey enough laws and follow enough customs, you can get to God. And we're going to see that that's totally opposite of what God really plans and wants. Let's all stand. We'll read this together. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 25. It says, At that time Jesus answered... And said, I thank you, Father, Lord heaven of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it has seemed, it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, today for your word. We stand upon your word today and the truth that it speaks. We thank you, Jesus, for the words that you've spoken so many years ago, but, but apply to our lives today. Father, I pray for those who are looking for that rest from their weariness, from their labor, and Father, maybe from a different angle than they've thought about this passage before. God, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to realize that we don't get to you by our labors. We get to you through Jesus, our, our Savior. Father, if someone needs Christ in their life today, I pray that they would surrender their life and come to Christ in repentance and believing and, and find salvation and rest, Lord, in him. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning we're going to talk about this passage and we're going to talk about the, the labor that's involved in this passage. Now first of all, I want you to know this, that labor is a part of life. No matter what you do, no matter who you are, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, labor is a part of life. It may look different from a child. It may look different from a, a young adult trying to raise a family. It may look, look different for a senior adult. Sometimes, probably senior adults, sometimes just getting out of bed and putting your clothes on is a labor, right? Just getting up out of bed. But labor is a part of life. Now, we can labor in many different ways. When we talk about labor... In general, actually, specifically, there's areas that we labor. First of all, we labor physically. That's what we usually think of, don't we? We think about our physical labor, how we labor physically, manual labor. And then there's a, a mental type of labor. And I know uh, a lot of people work physically, but then there's some people who work, and it's not necessarily with their hands and with their back and, and, and with their might. It's more with their, with their brain. I know my wife does that, and she comes home, and she's mentally exhausted at the end of the day from using her brain, and we go to bed, and it's an hour and a half before she can get her mind to shut off from all the things of the day, and, and I've told her, you've got to learn how to stop doing that, because I can do that too, and you have to learn how to shut it off. Does anybody ever have trouble shutting their minds off at the end of the day? That's a hard thing sometimes. Um, there's a mental type of labor. Then there's a, a, another type of labor that's an emotional type of labor. You know, maybe life issues that you're going through. Uh, some of you are going through some circumstances and things right now, and you're just labored and you're tired of having to face the things of life. 
and, and they make you weary. And then finally, there's a spiritual type of labor. And I know that uh, until you really feel what it is to go to spiritual battle against uh, the forces of evil, and, and you know, it talks about it, Paul talks about it in Ephesians, about, you know, we don't, we're not waging war against things in this earth. It's spiritual things that are going on. So right now, there's a spiritual battle going on for each of you, for your minds, for your hearts, for your thoughts, for, for, for everything about you, whether you're going to hear what God wants to say to you, whether you're going to listen to what God has to say to you and absorb it into your heart. First of all, it goes through your mind and into your heart. And then what do I do with that? So there's a battle going on for even your thoughts today. There's a spiritual battle. Labor is a part of life, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. You're probably facing labor in one of those ways right now. Well, here's the next thing I want you to hear. Our labor can lead us to exhaustion. Anybody here today feel a little exhausted? You're tired, you're weary, you're worn. That little girl keeps raising her hand. She is just so tired today, I tell you, I feel sorry for her right now. <laughs> it's hard being a kid, isn't it? Heidi, it's good to have you guys with us today. How, how old is your, what's her name and how old is she? Jillian's five. Jillian's five. Jillian, I'll be praying for you. I know you're really worn out today and I'm going to pray for you, okay? All right. You know, sometimes five-year-olds even get worn out, don't they? Uh, playing's hard work, isn't it? That's a blessing. That's right. That's right. Yes. Um, so sometimes labor can lead us to exhaustion. Now, now, you may not be there now. You may be past that right now. You're just totally wore out. Uh, uh, you can be physically exhausted. Sometimes we get physically exhausted from the labors of life. You can be mentally exhausted. Sometimes you just mentally are wore out. You're spent. You can be emotionally exhausted. Sometimes the emotions, the things we go through, just, just completely exhaust us. But then there's also a spiritual exhaustion. Now, spiritual exhaustion is a little different. I've, I've experienced that many times. And, it, and I, I experience it real heavily when we go on mission trips. Uh, when we go to Costa Rica... There, we'll go to Costa Rica, and we get up early, which I get up early anyway, and we may get up at 5.30, 6.30, somewhere in there, and we go out to face the day, and we travel up into the mountains usually, and we, we, uh, we go out, and we do ministry and things, and nothing is physically that hard that we do. Nothing is, is really uh, that hard as far as, as mentally. You just, uh, you just share Jesus, and, and you do what comes, should come natural. But by the, by the middle of the afternoon, a lot of times we would kind of be done with going to the schools and, and the things where we were going to minister to, and, and we maybe get back to the hotel about 2 or 3 in the afternoon, and I'd tell Lisa, I said, I am exhausted. I've just, I've got to go lay down for a little bit. I just, I, I'm just tired. And I'm like, but I haven't done anything. And we begin to realize the more we go on mission that when you're laboring for the Lord, it can be exhausting. Whenever you're sharing Christ, there's a spiritual battle going on and all these things happening. And you can spiritually be exhausted even if you're not physically doing that much. So there's all kinds of exhaustions involved. Well, see, Jesus was dealing with the people who were exhausted. Just like today, we get exhausted, we get tired, we get worn out. They were tired. They had to physically work. They had to mentally think. They had to, to emotionally go through the same things that we go through in many different ways. But they were spiritually exhausted too. You see, at this point in time, the people were dealing with the Pharisees, as I told you. The Pharisees were the ones who were, were and the Sadducees were the ones who were making the laws, and they were, uh, they were um, uh, putting the laws before the people. And there were so many laws and so many customs that the people were just worn out from it. If you want to get to God, if you want to be right with God, if you want to do what God wanted you to do, you had to do this and this and this, and you couldn't do this and this and this, and the list went on and on and on, and it went on forever. You know, sometimes today, as Christians, we're guilty about trying to make something so legalistic before the Lord that we wear ourselves out and we really never get to God. Did you hear what I said? Sometimes we can go through the motions, and sometimes we can go through what has always been. You, you know how you tell if something's a, a tradition in a church? You change it a little bit and see how much complaining you get. <laughs> if there's something that, that you change for, a, it could be a good reason, bad reason, I don't care, but you change something in a Baptist church or any church, 
and you see what happens. Well, we get in such a routine and we get into such a religious motion that we wear ourselves out and do all these different things and we never truly get to the heart of God. That's where these people were. It wasn't their fault. It's just by nature that's what they did. Why do you do this? It's because what we're to, it's what we're told to do. It's what we're taught to do. If I want to be right with God, if I want to get to God, if I want to be uh, uh, in God's presence, I have to do all these different things. And so they exhausted themselves trying to obey all the laws. Now, laws are good, but in and of themselves, they're laws. They're not, they're not something that gets us to God. Well, i got some good news for you today. Our salvation is never earned through your exhaustion. Your salvation will never be earned through your exhaustion, through your labors, through what you do. It doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter the things that you do. You can be the most religious person and obey all the laws, and you still will not get to God. Now listen to me on that. No one has ever, no one ever, ever, no one has ever worked their way into heaven. Amen? No one can work their way into heaven. Now, we work because we're saved. We don't work to be saved. And, and if you, we, we say that, and we say amen to that, but is that the way we live? Sometimes we get so caught up in it that we think, somehow this is going to make me right with God. That's not what makes you right with God. Jesus makes us right with God. How do they get to the Lord? Then Jesus came to show them that it's not by works. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It was by grace. Now look at verse 25. I want to I give you uh, uh, the way opposite of what the Pharisees were teaching, the way to salvation that is not earned by your exhaustion. The first thing in verse 25, look at what that verse says. At that time... Jesus answered. Now, he's answering the Pharisees who were hypocritical, who, were, uh, who were, had put all these legalistic uh, things upon the people. He says, at this time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father. Now, now, he's praying to God out loud, and these people are hearing this. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. The first thing that you have to know about getting to God that's outside of your exhaustion, your labor, uh, how you work towards that, it comes by revelation. You don't get to God through exhaustion. You get through revelation. Jesus reveals things to you. You know, I like to say some people think that, that they're all that and that they, they're right with God and, and they really don't know God because they don't, they've never been revealed the true God. The God of this universe, the God who's created us, the God who sustains us, the God who has made us. It comes by revelation. He says, not to the wise and the prudent. Those, ha have you ever seen a person that's so smart, they're just not very smart? Have you seen somebody, and, and I'm all for education. My wife's had a hundred years of it, so I'm all for it. But education in itself, you can be the smartest person when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to God, you can know every answer. You can give the Sunday school lecture. But unless it's revealed to you by God, you really don't know God. Sometimes the wisest people are really not, are really the most uneducated when it comes to God. He says, I didn't, I'm so glad, God, that you didn't, you hid these things from these guys who think they're all that. And you've revealed them to babes. Now, why would he say babes? Well, it says that we come to Christ as babes, as a childlike faith. Jesus always loved children. How many love children? We love children at all times. We even love children when they're screaming and crying, don't we, Sandy? Because they're babes. We need to take care of them and nurture them. We love them. We don't want them to be hurt. That's the way our Heavenly Father is towards us. And we come with a childlike faith before God, not by knowing all this stuff, not by revealing, not by anything but revelation to God, from God. And we come with a childlike faith. Right now, I could tell my grandson anything, and he would believe it. I could ask him to do anything. I could, right now, I could ask him to, to, to come up here and, and to uh, do, do something, and he would do it if, I, if he trusted me or because he trusts me. You know, when you've got a little child standing at the edge of the swimming pool, and they can't swim a lick, and you're in the water, and they see you in the water, and they know that they can trust you, and they don't know how to swim. They know they would drown. But when you say, jump to me, what do they do? 
Now, they're fearful, and they may hesitate, but you coax them enough, and you reveal to them, I am here, I'm going to catch you, you're going to be okay, and the child jumps in because they trust and believe in you. That's the first step to believing in Jesus and getting to the Father. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to have every, every bit of the Bible memorized. Does anybody ever have every scripture, every Bible verse memorized in the whole Bible? Probably not. I don't either. But I know enough to know that by revelation that God loves me and Jesus wants me to know him. It's by revelation. The next step is found in verse 27. Jesus says, All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one whom the Son wills to reveal him. What's that saying? Nobody finds God, He finds you. Sometimes people say, I came to Jesus. Well, you came to Jesus because He first came to you. You're saved not because you decided to be saved, but it's because Jesus drew you to that, and you decided to give in to what He's already drawn you to. No one saves themselves. How come it is sometimes people, you can tell them about Jesus and witness to them about Jesus, and it just doesn't seem like they get it? It's because they haven't listened to what Jesus is trying to tell them. He draws people to him. The next way is by relationship. That's what we see in verse 27. It's by relationship. God wants to give us a relationship with him, and we find that relationship through Jesus Christ. To know him. Now, now look at verse 27. It says, All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son. That word knows, that is not a knows by facts. I don't just know about God. It's a know. This word know in the Greek means an intimate, experiential relationship. So in other words, Jesus wants to give us not just the knowledge of God... He wants to reveal God to us that He is the Son and that the Son and the Father are one and they have this relationship together. But He wants to give that to us also. It's an experience. Sometimes we go through a physical experience or an emotional experience or a mental experience and we never have the spiritual experience of salvation. We can know all there is to know about God, and we can work hard for God, and we can, we can be emotional about it. We can cry our eyes out till there's no tears left in our eyes. But until that spiritual knowledge of intimacy with God is experienced, we, we don't really know God. It's by experience. Next thing I want us to hear. Jesus offers us rest from our labor. You know, that's what this passage is really leading to. Jesus is offering rest from labor. How how many of you would like to have rest from your labor right now, whatever it is, okay? Whether it be physical or emotional or or mental uh, or spiritual, Jesus wants to give us rest. Now, Now, this passage is taken out of context a lot, and it's just used about rest in general. I think there's some, some specifics here that you need to understand. It's a specific way that we find this rest. Jesus wants, us, wants to offer us rest from our labors. If Jesus wants to give us this rest to true believers who belong to Jesus, who have a relationship with Him, why are so many Christians so weary and exhausted? And the answer is found in these verses. Look in verse 29. Look at what verse 29, what Jesus says. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You've heard that verse probably a thousand times. Do you know when Jesus said that, he was talking to a people that would have understood exactly what a yoke meant. Now, you old timers understand what a yoke means, right? What a yoke means. How many of you understand what Jesus would be saying when he's talking about yoke? Okay, about half of you. He's not talking about a egg whites and egg yolk. He's talking about work. He's talking about labor. He's talking about a couple oxen that they would envision that would be yoked together, the old harness and yoke put together and working together and put it onto them. They would envision that immediately. Today we don't envision that, but that's what they would envision. They understood also that it went deeper than that. Because a yoke was also referred to as this. It was what a student would be considered under a rabbi. 
There was a lot of teaching that went on that day, and there would be different rabbis that would teach, and people would flock to them. And we learned through the Ray Vanderland how important it was and how much you gave up everything if you could study under these certain rabbis because it was this big, prestigious thing, important thing, and you had to make the cut because you were going to give it all to be able to be yoked with them. To be yoked with them meant that you studied them, you followed them, you learned from them. Just as Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You see, Jesus says it's not enough to know me through salvation, through a relationship. You may get it that you can never work your way to God, to heaven, to salvation. You may belong to Christ, but if you don't get this verse, you will always be weary in your faith. You know why so many people, so many Christians are weary in their faith? They never put on the yoke of truly being a Christian. Do you know Jesus was considered a rabbi even by the people who didn't believe in him? They understood he was a good teacher. They understood he was a powerful man. They saw the miracles that he did. But many of them, they wouldn't yoke themselves to him because they did not believe that he was God's son and the true way. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world? Say amen. amen. How many of you believe that Jesus knows the way and he is the one that you need to be following? Say amen. amen. Then you need to be yoked to him. You see, I think there's a lot of Christians that like to put a yoke on maybe on a Sunday morning just for a little bit and just come in and get a little taste of it. And then when you walk out the door, you take that yoke back off. There's Christians that like to, to live for the Lord when it's convenient. I can put it on. I can handle this yoke myself, and I'll bear the burden of being a Christian, and I'll follow Jesus. But when it gets hard or difficult or something happens, I'm taking that yoke off. Or when I'm around a certain type of friends that I have or in my workplace, I take that yoke of being a Christian off. Or maybe when I'm around a, a, a family member or something like that, I'm not going to talk about Jesus. I'm not going to be yoked to Jesus. I'm not going to let myself be tied to him. But this yoke was a permanent, everlasting yoke that he's talking about. You see, they understood that this was discipleship. We talk about discipleship, to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's too many people in the churches today that have no idea what it is to be a disciple and follower of Jesus. To learn from him, to follow him. Every word, every move, everything, they study Jesus. You want to know how to release the yoke? You become a student of the word and you become a follower of Jesus and your yoke will be easier. Now what do I mean by that? We see following Jesus makes all of our labors easier. Like I said, something physically that you are really exhausted from, God can make that easier. Something mentally that you're having to go through, God can make that easier. Something emotionally that you're struggling with right now, God can make that easier. Something spiritually that you're fighting right now against, God can make that easier. But the word easier, we have to understand what that means. Too many times we read the text and we don't understand what the text is saying, but we don't understand easier. I think easier means it's just going to be simpler and, and easier for me to do. And that's not what that scripture is saying. The word easier in the Greek text, easy, when it says easy, Jesus says in verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Everybody wants an easier way and a lighter way, but the easier that he's talking about here does not mean that you're not going to go through things, you're not going to face things. The word easier means well fit. That word means well fit. It means tailor made. You could say that word easier means tailor made. Back when I first started preaching many years ago now, preachers got to have suits, don't they? Now, Gordon, I'm sorry, but I thank God preachers don't have to wear suit and ties every Sunday, okay? I, I know, I know. That's tough. You don't even have a suit and tie, and you look just like me today. I've you, you backslidden there, Mr. Sansom. That's right. I bet you still got your keys in your pocket. You can jingle, though, can't you? Yeah, okay. Old habits are hard to break, aren't they? When I first started preaching, preachers got to have suits, and I didn't have a suit. I had one I'd, you know, from years ago. I didn't have a suit. It wouldn't fit me anymore anyway. 
And so I went. I, I wasn't even a pastor yet. I was just going to be a preacher. And Bre Greg and Pam Carr, Greg was our pastor at the time, and he said, I know a place in St. Louis, uh, a suit place. You can go down and, and you can buy suits real cheap. So I saved up some money that I'd made from, from going out and preaching. I thought, I'll take that money and I'll buy some suits. So we went down there and it was, it was I won't say the name of it. They may sue me if they see it on the internet, so I won't say that. Went to the suit company and went in and they're, they're tailor-made. Now, they're, it's, it wasn't like a high-end. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, you know. It wasn't like these $1,000, $2,000 suits. It was just regular suits, but they would custom fit you to, 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 to be right. And so I go in and this little Chinese gal comes out. She's about this tall. She starts taking all these measurements and everything. And I pick out three suits. And I think, you know what, these suits are going to fit right, they're going to be great, and I just, I can't wait to try them out, so I go home, because they have to tailor make them, and she makes them, you know, sews them up, custom fit just for me. And I get them home, and I try them on, and the pants are too tight, and the arms are too short, and the, the shoulders are not broad enough, and I'm thinking, I could have made these suits better than she did. And I still, every time I have to wear those suits, I get mad at that little Chinese gal every time I wear them. <laughs> I paid you money to custom fit something that fits me just right so I can be comfortable, easier. I still have to preach funerals. I still have to do weddings. I still have to deal with things in my life, mentally, physically, emotionally. But at least I got a well-fit suit that's something I can grab a hold of. But I didn't get that. Why? Because people cannot fit you the way that God can fit you. I know all these exhaustions that you're going through right now. Some of you right now, you didn't even raise your hand, but you're exhausted from something. You don't know if you can take any more. You're about at your wit's end. Mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it may be. But I can tell you, if you take the yoke of Jesus on... Not just on Sunday, every day of your life. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'm going to learn from you, Jesus. I'm going to walk with you, Jesus. And I know you, you, Jesus had a hard path to walk. But I know just because I have you wrapped around me t to secure me, to make me feel like I belong to you, that whatever I face in life is suited just for me. You'll never leave me. You'll never forsake me. You'll give me everything that I need. And it gets a little easier. And my burden becomes a little lighter. You see, that's exactly what God wants to give us today. I can't promise you that physically you're not going to still have to work your tail off. I can't promise you mentally that you're not going to be exhausted from all the things you have to think of. I can't promise you that emotionally that you're still not going to be just a mess. And I can't promise you, well, I can promise you this. If you're living for the Lord, you're going to have a spiritual battle. Automatic. But if you take that yoke of Jesus on, it is easy. It's well fit just for you. You're looking for God's purpose. Take Jesus on and you will be living God's purpose. The burden being light. Jesus can free us from our burdens. If you haven't heard one other thing, listen to this today. Somebody needs to hear this today. Our burdens become lighter. Now, I'm not saying the pressures of family and work and all these things are going to be gone. How is my burden going to get lighter? Here's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus can free our burden of sin. Amen? Do you remember the first day, the moment you gave your life to Christ? And everything seemed like it just was so good. But you remember that, don't you, Jeff? Just set free. And then all of a sudden, the sin begins to entangle us again. The things begin to entangle us. And the world's things start happening. And all of a sudden, we're burdened down again. And Jesus said, I want to set you free every day. 
I want to set you free from everything. The sin that is holding you down, you let go of, and your burdens will be much lighter. Jesus wants to set us free from sin, from guilt. How many of you feel guilty about something? Jesus can free us from that guilt. How many of you feel shameful about something? Jesus can free you from that shame. How many of you fear something? Jesus can set you free from that fear. How many of you worry about things? Jesus can set you free from that worry. It doesn't mean it's going to be gone. He means he can set you free. That's exactly what he's talking about in this passage. So today as the instrumentalists come, are you looking for rest from all your labors today? I look out here and I know that there's some kind of burdens everywhere upon people and some kind of things that are going on. It may be physical, it may be mental, it may be emotional, it may be spiritual, it may be all of the above. I'm telling you today, if you will follow Jesus in discipleship, come to him at his invitation. If you're heavy laden, he says, I will give you rest. Not I may, I could, I will. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly at heart and you will find rest from your soul. That's exactly what you want. For my yoke is easy. It's, it's tailor-made just for you. And that burden that you are carrying right now, all the burdens, He can set you free from. The greatest burden that you carry right now is the sin that, that entangles your life. He can set you free from that today. How do you do that? Well, in the passage right before that, you know what He says? He says a word that everyone has to to be set free, and that is repent. So if you want that freedom today, you have to repent and ask Jesus to fully take over. You have to humble yourself. You have to admit that you're not all in all and you just give it to God. If you're lost, you repent and say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I'm a sinner and I want to be set free. If you're saved and you're not fully yoked to him and you're trying to live it your way and you're trying to figure out and you're stressed and heavy laden, come, come to this altar today and say, God, I just give it to you today. I need, I need your rest. Father, I thank you, God, for this day, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus, who, if we believe Jesus died for us and, and that you rose him from the dead, that he's risen from the dead, there's more power in that than anything it's going to take to free us today. I thank you, Jesus, that you came and you've given us life, not a stress-worry-free life, but just an easier life, fit for us lighten our burdens God just help us to be faithful to you and the repentance Lord the, the movement Lord in our hearts let it be real today let us find that rest in you the rest that we're all looking for that we can't find is found in you God today in Jesus name Amen